Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 24, The Oracle of Delphi. Visiting Greece, there are so many amazing ancient Greek sites to visit. It becomes overwhelming narrowing down which ones to see and which ones you're going to have to skip. But Delphi, high up in the mountains, is one of the most beautiful memories that I have from my time in Greece, and I want to make sure to share those with you. The history of the site is enthralling, the views are enchanting, and everywhere you see echoes of why the ancient Greeks felt this place to be home of one of their gods. My guest today is Ryan Stitt, host of the History of Ancient Greece podcast. He's back to talk about what the Greeks were doing when they visited Delphi, how the oracle actually worked, and what happened when it didn't, and the role the oracle played in the rise and fall of various Greek figures and states. My guest today is Ryan Stitt, host of the History of Ancient Greek podcast, and Ryan is a returning guest, our second returning guest. So hi, Ryan. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me back. I enjoyed our conversation earlier, and I'm glad to talk about the topic on hand today. Yeah, I am really excited to have you back. I've So this is the second podcast that you and I will do about ancient Greece, and I recorded another one, and people really, really love them. So before we dive into today's topic, which is Delphi. I just kind of want to ask you what your opinions are. Why do you think that modern Canadians, Americans, Brits connect so much with the story of ancient Greece? Because really, ancient Greece and ancient Rome are definitely the two biggest topics whenever I release episodes. In a lot of aspects, it's a part of the founding of our Western civilization. I mean, obviously, there's uh, influences from other things, but through our educational system throughout the years, the history of Greece, their political structures, their philosophy, law, all science, all that sort of stuff is sort of the founding bedrock of a lot of the educational structures going up, a lot of our institutions and sort of things. So people will look back onto the ancients to realize their, to look upon their origins, to see where things started, their roots, that sort of thing. It's always fascinating. At least that's that's why I'm fascinated with the ancients. I love looking back into and seeing the origins of things, how we, why we do what we do. And I get the feeling with my conversations with a lot of people that that's their fascination too, with a lot of people, especially in the Western world. And as I said, uh, there are a lot of Eastern influences too. And there are a lot of people from uh, the Eastern countries that are fascinated with the ancient world too. If you go to any touristy location, you'll see a vast majority of people from different countries. So it's a, it's a worldwide people gra- uh, gravitate towards the ancient world from a worldwide perspective. Interesting. If you weren't doing a podcast about ancient Greece and you had to do a podcast about a modern society, what one would you pick? What do you mean by modern? Like how, like right now? Oh, you're such an ancient history podcaster that you're like, what is modern? Let's do a 1500 on. Okay, so my second favorite time period is the uh, late medieval Italy and the uh, Italian Renaissance period. So that would be it, probably. But still. It might not be as modern as you are anticipating, <laughs> but I, uh, that's probably, that'd probably be it. Most modern history, uh, that's tough. I, I lose severe interest in the details of history after like... 1800 <laughs> um so there's i don't think i could do a podcast on say like the civil war even though i, I find it it's fascinating i just getting into the details of it wouldn't be as interesting as say that's just my own personal liking which is not for everyone i guess but like the late medieval renaissance uh, early modern europe would probably be my second area uh, if I were to ever do another podcast, which this one's a lot of work, I think I'm going to be burnt out by the time I finish. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Delphi. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Oracle, but also it's more than the Oracle, which I don't know. Before I got there, I didn't realize exactly what Delphi was. But Delphi was a town. It was a series of temples. There were a lot of things there. It was more than the Oracle. People traveled there in part because of the Oracle. But it was a lot more than that. So what 
I guess let's back up and, and what was the town of or the area that we know as Delphi like before it became important to the ancient Greeks? So there was a phenomenon in about the 8th century BC or so. Uh, you saw the rise in religious sanctuaries and shrines and then the festivals um, that stopped being like local, but like a Panhellenic type where they reinforced the idea of being Greek. So you started getting pilgrims and flockage people coming there, leaving deposits, the festivals started to arise. And so we got we got a, a few of these that were very, very important and grew in, and grew even more large. So you have the uh, Sanctuary of Zeus and Herod Olympia, where they had the Olympic Games, and you have Apollo and Artemis at Delos, and then you have the two places that are or- that have or- oracular powers. Uh, so you have or the Sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi, as we are talking about, and also the Shrine of Zeus at Dodona, which is in northwestern Greece. Uh, Dodona was a little bit a little bit older, um, so people were around Delphi since the Bronze Age, but it started to get a significance like I said, in the 8th century BC, and it started to attract uh, visitors from all over the Greek-speaking world. And people would come, and, and there would be large complexes of temples, uh, de- treasure houses are depositing gifts, and holy precincts started to be built up. Um, so it ultimately, it, it, it took in a big way, and then by the 6th century, it, it, it reached a outside of Greece importance. So you hear stories with the Lydians and even the Romans coming there. How true are those stories? That's a, that's another story. But at <laughs> least we have them in the sources. <laughs> so what was the importance of Delphi? What were the mythology that was behind it that made people feel like they needed to go there? The ancient Greeks, um, they seldom undertook important matters without first consulting the oracle at Delphi. So in Greek myth, Delphi was where the god Apollo slain the serpent python and then he established a sanctuary there and then it was also the location of the omphalos which means navel so the omphalos was um this is myth obviously we're talking about myth (laughs) so the omphalos was the rock that Rhea wrapped in swaddling clothes and then swapped out for baby zeus and then fed it to Kronos, who was devouring his children and then he vomited them up and then we had the titanomachy zeus overthrew his father Afterwards, he sent out these two eagles to fly across the world in opposite directions, and one from each, one from the east and one from the west, and at, and at the same speed. And the location that they came upon, uh, which was at Delphi, he placed this stone to mark off what the Greeks believed was the center of the world. So Delphi, in their minds, was the center of the world, or the navel of the world. Literally means navel. There was an early sanctuary there. So to get back to Apollo, there was an early sanctuary there to Gaia, or Mother Earth and Demeter, a goddess of agriculture. So, um, and there was a serpent named Python, um, where we get the name Pythia, we'll get to that later, lived there and they protected that on Phallos. And so in order to, for Apollo to claim the sanctuary for himself, he had to slay the Python. So, but the Python was a uh, mother earth's son as most creatures were. And uh, Apollo had to cleanse himself of the murder afterwards. So he became a slave to a local king for eight years doing menial labor, King and Mattis. And then afterwards, he was able to st- uh, establish a sanctuary there. And there's a Homeric hymn to Apollo that was written at some point in the 8th to 6th centuries BC. Uh, and, it, and it talks about this myth quite a bit. And it said that this ancient name of the site had been Chrysa, but was later named Delphi or Delphi, depending on how you want to pronounce it, because one of Apollo's epithets was Delphinios, which means dolphin. Uh, he was worshipped in this manner since he supposedly swam to this area as a dolphin. It's myth. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, that's the ideological explanation for the name. But despite these traditions, which I should mention came later in literature, Delphi's original connections to Apollo are difficult to discern. Um, Homer only mentions the sanctuary of Delphi twice. He refers to the stone dorsal of the arch of the archer Phoebus Apollo, as he called him in Rocky Pytho in the Iliad. And then he mentions uh, Phoebus Apollo as a god of the prophecy in the Odyssey. So he only mentions him twice. So the early the early roots are hard to, uh, are hard to uh, determine. Uh, we get a lot of information about Delphi from later Roman sources, well, Greeks, Greek speakers in the Roman world, such as Strabo, Pausanias, and Plutarch, who himself was a priest at Delphi. So a lot of the sources we have are later. So with the, ca- the normal caveat, was later so that might not be how it was early 
as most things were. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So do we know anything about what like the archaeology or what archaeologists believe that they can tell from the site itself what how it might have changed from the beginning to when it kind of blossomed? Yeah, uh, yes. So the sanctuary of Apollo, which is the main sanctuary of the site, there's actually two sanctuaries. There's one uh, that's halfway up Parnassus, which is the sanctuary of Apollo, and then there's a sanctuary in the south, which we can talk about later too, which is itself fascinating. It's not related to Apollo, but uh, to Athena. But there was a boundary wall that started to be built around the sanctuary of Apollo around 800 BC. Like I said, in the 8th century, it started to gain some importance. And there was a first temple built there in the 7th century BC with two remodels in the following century in the late 6th. So we're talking 500-ish, so like 30 years before the Persian Wars. And then one in the early 4th century. So three, three different phases. So also uh, near the Umbala stone, which is, you can, you can see it there. Well, they claim to be the Umbala stone. <laughs> it's actually pretty big and it's fascinating, but yeah, it's that's cool story. to look at. Like it's like uh, one of the first, I feel like you walk in, it's like one of the first things that you see. That's like an important part of the site. Oh yeah. You can, you can see it from a quite a distance away. Um, it's pretty fascinating. It's, it's actually right next to the sanctuary, not the sanctuary, I'm sorry, the treasury of the Athenians, which we'll talk about later. It's a later thing. But like it's so it's like right near there. And then it's as you ascend up, it, you see the remains of the Temple of Apollo. So it's this majestic looking scenery. So it gives it that sort of feel, which is, I guess is it gives it its mystique. But uh, so, yeah, so there's the Umbala Stone. It's on the sacred way, which is the path that you take up to the sanctuary. So every all so as you enter guests today, ancient visitors and modern visitors, as they entered, they would have took a predetermined path all the way up the, uh, the mountainside. So it's on the Sacred Way leading. And there's also this thing called uh, Rock of the Sibyl, which was a early oracle there before the Pythia, or the, which we'll talk about. Um, she sat up on this rock and supposedly foretold the, foretold the future. We don't have a whole lot of information about that. Uh, Pausanias mentions it uh, later and other later sources. She basically was the oracle before the Pythia, who the Pythia was named after the Python, and she was a priestess who sat in the temple, and she sat on a tripod, and she got super high and gave out these, the will of the god. Um, yeah, let's stop and talk about actually what the oracle really was. So these were women, and where did these women come from? So the Pythia was required to be an older peasant woman. She had to be uh, older than 50 years old and native to the region, and she had to have lived a pure life. So she was appointed for her whole life, and she had to remain chaste after she was appointed. So before delivering a prophecy, she first had to purify herself in a local spring. It's called the Castalian Spring. And then she burnt these uh, laurel leaves and some barley meal on an altar of Apollo's temple. And then there's priests there that... Um, that assisted her and they sacrificed uh, a goat or some other animal and examined its entrails, read the flights of birds and conducted other sorts of prophecy, uh, divination, uh, divination, that sort of things. And so after they received a good omen then the priests ushered and ushered in the question askers into the uh, Adaton, which is the back room of the temple of Apollo. And this is where the Pythia, she sat upon her bronze tripod. And uh, then the people would ask her these questions. She became entranced, and it was believed that Apollo spoke his divine will to her. Well, as one might expect, in the 19th century, a lot of scholars uh, sought to find an, expl an actual explanation for this. Like, well, like obviously, the god's not speaking to her. At least that's what the majority of people thought. <laughs> some people might think that they were. I'm not going to go down that path. But so they uh, eventually had some geologists survey the area, and they found that there was... Uh, two cross faults that met directly underneath the temple of Apollo where the Pythia sat. And earthquakes actually occurred quite frequently on the mountainside. Um, that's why there were several phases in the temples that I mentioned earlier, because it was felled a few times by earthquakes. And it's also part of why it has that like religious mystical feel is that mm -hmm. it's rumbling. It's like Apollo's mm -hmm. talking to you. Yeah, exactly. And you know, like um, there was, there's so many earthquakes mentioned in the historical sources too i mean like even herodotus mentions during the persian wars when the persians try to sack the temple uh, or the sanctuary of apollo 
they heard these rocks rumbling from the mountaintop coming down and they scared and they ran away. Like it was uh, that sort of stuff. So it was like very mystic, as you mentioned. So the earthquakes occurred often on, and they have these faults. And so the cracks would continuously open and close. And they also found that the Castalian spring flowed up towards the temple and it disappeared underneath. So it created a crevice that in, that emitted vapors. And so according to legend, we'll, we'll go back to legend real quick. When Apollo slew the python, its body fell into this fissure and fumes arose from its decomposing body. And um, it was from these that the Pythia supposedly gained her famous powers of prophecy. And so, but geologists trying to give a actual explanation for this, uh, they actually, in doing so, they found traces of methane or and ethyl, ethylene gas in the water. And the Pythia also was said to have chewed oleander leaves and inhaled its smoke, which could cause epilepsy or sort of things that happen. So some have suggested that the, and others have also suggested that the Omphalo stone had intoxicating vapors. So there's all sorts of explanations given as to how she got into that uh, trance. Seems like she was having a romping good time, whatever yeah. the case. Uh, like, so whatever the case was, she would inhale these gases and fall into a hallucinogenic trance. And theoretically or spiritually, however you want to identify it, allowed Apollo to possess her spirit and speak to her. And then she prophesied his will in the form of this crazy ecstatic speech. She blurted out words that did not make any sense. And it was up to the tr- priest of the temple to translate it into spoken Greek for those who asked the question. So these, um, these responses were very riddle-like uh, and they required massive amounts of interpretation by whoever asked the question. They were not straightforward. The one who asked the question had to think about it, and most of the time, uh, the oracles, though, must have been right a majority of the time. Um, I mean, we get most of our famous examples are of people who misunderstood oracles and disastrous things came to them. But Delphi was so popular, and people spent a, that, a lot of money giving dedications there and time traveling there because it, it was not a, it was a very remote site that it leads me to believe that they must have been right the majority of the time, because if they were wrong, people would have not frequented it as much. Um, we were told that the lines are always very long and people would bribe the priests and dedicate things there to get to the front of the line or to gain the favor, favor of the gods. You see all sorts of things in the museum there, which we can talk about later, or we can talk about it if you want. Uh, I love the museum. <laughs> you see all sorts of, uh, there was all sorts of treasuries there. Uh, one theory uh, to explain everything uh, that modern scholars tend to push forward is that uh, these priests had a network of spies throughout the known world. So they were informed of all that was happening, both politically and socially. Um, and they must have had talked extensively to the, all the various types of people who came through and they just soaked everything up like a sponge. So basically, it made Delphi the hub for information in the Mediterranean world. They knew what was going on so they could best answer people's questions. But... Also, what most of what was asked was probably just required a, a simple yes or no answer. So people would come seeking advice on things like, uh, should I go to war? Or should I start a colony? Should I establish a cult here? Things about plague, famine, sickness. Who were the typical people that were asking questions? Like, if somebody was coming to Delphi, was it everybody in the family asked a question? Or was it just... The patriarch asked a question, and who all came with them? I guess it depends how far away you are, but typically it was usually just the patriarch that I recall in most of the prophecies uh, in the historic that are recorded in the sources. But like it, that, that doesn't necessarily I mean that that was the only people who went. That's just, just what we have. Yeah. yeah, that's just what we have. So a lot of it was like, especially during this time period, you had to get approval from Delphi to do things. Like you actually had to get approval from them. So like, if you, because uh, it, it was considered uh, unsafe or against the God's will, if you were to try to embark on certain things, like, should I establish a colony? Well, if the Delphi tells you it's a terrible decision to establish this colony at this specific place, you're not going to get the, if you don't have the backing of the gods, it's people are not going to be wanting to go with you because it's a, because cut out of fear, basically. So you uh, and a lot of people who established these sorts of cult uh, things and did some of these and did some of these issues were men. So it makes sense that at least in the ancient Greek worldview that the people who would be frequenting them would be the patriarch of the family. So 
Did that lead into the idea then that they were never wrong because they also, they were making the decision. So whatever they decided was the right answer. It's a little bit like if you ask your mom to tell the future. <laughs> actually, uh, that's actually a very good way of putting it. You're never wrong because you're the dad uh, or the mom in certain cases. Um, it was my dad growing up. <laughs> uh, why did you do that? Because I said so and I'm always right. <laughs> uh, Definitely my mom and yeah. the family. Sorry, dad. I don't think my dad listens anyway, so it's fine. It's probably the, the most accurate way of putting it. But uh, a lot of the times you get these uh, stories, most of the famous stories are where people just didn't understand the oracles and disastrous things happened to them. So especially when it came in internationally or and we get we get stories of myths, trips to Delphi during in the mythic world, too. So you get things like I guess one of the most famous was with, um, in the late 6th century B.C., King Croesus of Lydia wanted to invade Persia. So he wanted to ask the oracles, there was multiple of them throughout the ancient world, if it would be a good move. So by this point, Delphi uh, had reached influence around the periphery of the Greek world. So Lydia was central, west central Turkey, modern day Turkey. So Anatolia, Asia Minor, to use the uh, ancient terms. So he eventually determined Delphi to be the most legitimate so messengers were sent there, and and they asked the Pythia. So in this case, they were envoys. They, they were official envoys. They weren't like the patriarch because people went there. Like, as we mentioned, people could go there on their own behalf. But when it was state institutions, it was uh, envoys. The Spartans, for example, had a uh, had an actual office um, called the Pythioi. Uh, they were people who were emissaries that were sent directly to Delphi to ask questions on behalf of the Spartan state. To answer your question, that happened as well. Anyway, <laughs> so he asked this, what could possibly be said by many to be the most famous oracle response that comes out of antiqu antiquity, as Herodotus puts it up. He said, uh, the response that came back was, if you attack the Persians, you will destroy a great empire. And uh, Croesus was extremely confident. He was a rich, filthy rich king. So he had heard what he thought was exactly what he wanted to hear. Uh, he thought that the great empire that would be destroyed would be the Persian Empire, not his own. He didn't even think that that could be a possibility. So he crossed the House River. He fought the Persians. The Lydians were crushed. And the Oracle was correct. So those are the type of things that the Oracle, they were very, they were up to interpretations. So it's not that they were right or they were wrong. They just, they were very uh, philosophical, <laughs> if I if I will. Well, the ones that we know left enough room for interpretation that they physically couldn't be wrong, correct? Yeah. I mean, there was there was questions that required yes or no answers, too, as we mentioned. Like, is it good for me to uh, do something? And there are have been more straightforward responses, I would imagine. We just don't have those recorded because they're not worthy of Herodotus's digressions and weird, crazy, interesting stories. So when you get to Delphi, you kind of walk in, you buy your ticket, you pretty much see the Omphalos stone pretty quickly. What are the other things that you're seeing and why are they there? Because they're, as you walk in and up the hill, it's just covered in historic relics and they're all interesting and they all deserve like their own 10 minutes, but obviously we don't have time for that. But like, what are, what are they and what, and why are they there and what's the history behind them? Okay. So as we've mentioned quite a bit already. By the late 8th century, Delphi had become a well-known throughout the Greek world. People would come and ask them uh, the Pythia for answers. And as a result, it became, obviously, whatever it was that they were seeking, most, most of the times must have came true because in their adoration and appreciation, they started leaving a large number of votive offerings, uh, lot, lots of pottery, bronze tripods. And by the time we get to the 6th century, so about 150 years later or so, we start seeing larger, more lavish dedications, gold, silver, statues. There are quite a few of them um, that, that have been found in our in the museum. Uh, Statues-wise, you have the famous, the large twin Koro statues uh, that have been identified as Cleobis and Bitone, uh, which is a famous tale in uh, Herodotus about these two twins who, when their mother's carriage broke down and she was supposed to make it to this sanctuary of Hera in Argos for, for, to worship. They took the place of the missing oxen who had ran off when the carriage broke down and they carried her six miles and then 
they died. It's an interesting digression in Herodotus, it's a philosophical digression. So you have these famous statues that have been attributed to them. Attribution is not 100%, though. Some people argue. But anyway, they're you have like these massively large statues. Uh, Pausanias also wrote about a large bronze bull that was dedicated there uh, by the Corsairan. So you not only have individuals donating massive dedications, but you also have the states. Whenever a battle was won, Greek city-states tried to outdo each other to gain prestige. So they started to build more and more larger things there, dedicatory to show their thankfulness to the gods. Another famous uh, piece there that you see in the museum is the fam- is the large uh, Sphinx of, from Naxos, which is one of the richest islands in the Cyclades at that point. Um, it sits atop this map. It's about 40 feet high. It's, it's this colossal marble ionic column. Um, and you see Sphinx at Silat, uh protecting funerary tombs and context and sort of like that. It's a, for those who aren't familiar, it's a head, the head of a woman, a body of a lion, and uh, the feathers of a bird of prey, which turns upwards in the specific statue. It's really cool. So Make sure you don't, you won't miss it if you go to the museum, but it's one of the highlights there. And you also have uh, images there of specific people. These tend to have come a little later. So after um, the Spartans were defeated in the 4th century BC, uh, the Achaeans erected statues of their kings. And then after, and even Philip II and Alexander the Great later had statues of themselves erected there. So basically anyone who was anyone had a commemoration at Delphi, if you were an important individual, or if you were an important state, you try to outdo each other. Some city-states even dedicated these large, what we would call treasuries, to store all of their dedicatory offerings. So three famous ones. There was a bunch. Most of them are leveled now. And we'll talk about, we can talk about why later. But there was a bunch. There was the treasury of the Sicyones, which was the oldest known Tholo style, which is a circular style. And then there was the treasury of the Scythians. Um, the one in the Sicyon, these were from the 6th century. The one in the Sicyonians, um, it has pretty famous relief uh, sculptures that you can find in the museum that uh, show uh, the exploits of Heracles. Um, they all emphasize myths that are special to the polis of Sicyon. So the Caledonian boar hunt, the adventures of the Argonauts, the Dioscoro. All that's left are the stone foundations, but like I said, several metopes can be seen in the museum. They're fascinating. The treasury of the Scythians is another one. It's no longer standing either, but there's tons of sculpture frag- fragments as well. It's actually very fascinating because it was um, it was believed to be the most lavish of them all um, because it was funded by the silver mines and gold mines that was controlled by the island of Sifnaus. And it was uh, one of the forerunners of the Caryatids. So it had two columns uh, of the front porch uh, were replaced by these female figures that were carved in the round. There was another treasury there built by the Canadians that had a, a Caryatid porch as well. So you have those two, but the, obviously the most famous example of this was the Erechtheon on the Acropolis of Athens, which we talked about in the previous episode that I was on. Um, so go check that out. So yeah, the, uh, it was uh, one of the early forerunners. It was, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. There's also a lot of pedimental sculptures you can see in the museum as well, featuring the Trojan, showing images of the Trojan War and the Gigantomachy, or the battle between the gods and the giants. The best preserved of them all, though, was the treasury of the Athenians, as we mentioned earlier, it's close to the Amphalos stone. Uh, it was built either to commemorate their establishment of their, their democracy or is after the Battle of Marathon. We're not really sure. There's arguments on both sides, but it was around that time period. It's a small temple-like structure. So it's a, it was built on this high pedestal uh, to deter thievery because I guess uh, treasury, there were now and then people stole things, uh, sadly. Um, so I guess they built it up on this high pedestal. Um, it was restored in the ni- early 1900s by the French archaeologist school. So it's all together there. And it was, uh, it was restored and it, uh, it was originally built from with Perion marble. And then, so they restored it with newer marble where they needed to. Uh, so the, the relief metopes also can be seen in the museum. They're really cool. Uh, typical of temple like structures at that time, they show, by the Athenians, they show the Amazonomachy, the labors of Heracles, life of Theseus, things like that. They're also covered with a ton of inscriptions. The, the temple, the, the treasury, the walls of the treasury are with um, about the many Athenian victories at the Pythian Games, which are the uh, games held at Delphi. And also hymns to Apollo, and there's some musical notation. And, and then 
they held certain spoils from their victory marathon. They even had Persian short, uh, Persian ships, shields, and swords, and that sort of, and that sort of stuff on a platform next to the side. So it was this very lucrative, very expensive, very ostentatious way of like promoting your city state, uh, and they tried to outdo each other as the Greeks tried to do. So it's fascinating. You'll see all of these. You'll see the foundations. Uh, for the most part. So when you enter the sanctuary, there's this long winding road up to the temple. So the first leg of that is you'll see basically the bases for everything. And then you'll start to see a little bit more. And then you'll get and then you'll get about midway up the mountain and you'll see the tre- the restored treasury of the Athenians and then the Omphalos stone. And then on the next leg, it's like, boom, there's the temple. It's a pretty mystic walk. Uh, if you turn around, you look out and look at the plains. It's pretty beautiful as well. I've been there twice. It's one of my favorite places, and I want to go back again. So I went on, like, that first day of October that felt like fall. So it had, like, this otherworldly feel to it, too, just from that. But even though I was there on, like, a group tour, and I was the only single person on the group tour, everybody else that was there was, like, part of a couple, which was really weird. I, I've heard of that happening on tours, but I had not experienced it before. And I liked my guide. She was very knowledgeable, but we didn't like click where I wanted to like spend my like lots of extra time with her or anything. So it was just like a weird confluence of events. But I like by the time I got up to the I want to say it's the stadium at the top um, or the arena at the top, I was completely in love with the place and I would definitely go back at a heartbeat. And I, it, you know, it's not, it is a little bit, a tiny bit of a trek out of Athens. You got to either take, I think you got to take two buses or rent a car or go on a tour, but it's so worth it. If people are going to be in the area, they should not miss it. Yeah. Imagine having to make that trek in the ancient world. It, they said it take, it takes about three months for anyone to get to Delphi, get their, get their um, answer and come back. So, I mean, it's not like people were just willy-nilly going there. That took a lot of time. And that's <laughs> time you were away from your farm or whatever your craft was. As an aside, you should definitely hike up Mount Parnassus. Mythically, it's where the nine muses supposedly reside. It. So that's cool. And it's also really beautiful when you get to the top. So the stadium at the top is as high as I got up. But, I was, but the view is gorgeous. I think I used that picture as like my profile picture forever because it was just so pretty. Like it's just one of the prettiest places. I didn't have time to hike and I didn't have time to go into the museum because the drawback of doing an organized tour is that you have to make decisions about how you're going to spend your time. You're not in control of how much time you spend somewhere. But for me, it was a little bit not intimidating trying to figure out how to take the buses. It just seemed like a lot to deal with. Uh, so I did not. I just did an organized tour. Luckily, I didn't have to deal with all that. Uh, both the times I went, the first time was when I was on a tour. So we were there for a day, which is cool. We got to s- see Delphi, but we barely even saw, we didn't even go to the lower sanctuary, which we haven't talked about yet, which is cool in itself. It's really cool. The lower sanctuary. The following year, when I came back to Athens as a student, we took a a teacher guided trip up there for two days. So we got to see all of it and we got a, our teacher was a tour guide. Um, so it was really cool. That And so we got to do, and we got to see the local town. So we got to spend more time. So I was, I didn't have to worry about like trying to get up there and hurry and rush yeah. and see things, which I'm thankful for. But when I go back, I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to get there myself now that I'm no longer a student. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan. So what are, there are so many things at Delphi. It's a really big place. Um, What are the, you know, the most important things that like places in it that we haven't covered yet that people should know about? So uh, as we have alluded to, uh, there's the theater and there's the stadium. And then way down south, there is the sanctuary of Athena, Pronius. Um, The theater, it's the next level up from the temple and the stadium is even further up. So the Delphi also hosted what was called the Pythion Games. They were established in 582 BC following their victory in what was called the First Sacred War. So there was a series of sacred wars. We won't go into too much detail, but the polises around the area uh, vied for control of Delphi and 
the Greeks wanted it to remain neutral. It's a sacred area, so anytime anyone tried to exert control, it led to certain wars. Uh, there was a series of them over hundreds of years span. Anyway, so the first one uh, after Apollo or after Delphi was wrestled control away from the local uh, town of Crissa, it's uh, they instituted the Pythian Games. They became a part of what was known as the Panhellenic uh, Rotation of Festivals. Uh, which also included the Olympic Games uh, at Olympia, the Isthmian Games for Poseidon at Corinth, and the Nemean Games for Zeus in Argos. So they were rotated every four years, and they pretty much followed the same uh, athletic design. Um, there was just, at, at uh, since Apollo is uh, a god of music and poetry, there was also competitions at uh, Pythia, as well as the pan Games as well, which is another series of games that were at Athens. There's, al there's also, in the theater, there, they also had other non-athletic competitions there as well. The athletic events they uh, competed in were typical for the uh, Olympic Games. So you had the Stadion, which is where we get the name of it. It's a one-stage race, so just one run. Then you had the Diolus, which is a two-stage race. You had things like the Dolikos, which is a long distance running race of 24 states. So like, I think long distance. Uh, you had the pentathlon. So it included a race, wrestling, jumping, discus throwing, and javelin throwing. Um, we'll get back to it, but in the lower sanctuaries where they had a lot of the, uh, they had the palestra, which is where you wrestle and things like that, where a lot of that took place. The stadium was high at the top where the running events took place. They also had uh, chariot racing, uh, boxing, and then my personal favorite, uh, the Pankration, which is kind of like mixed martial arts. Um, the only thing you couldn't do was gouge out eyes. <laughs> Basically, no holds barred. There, uh, there's also a competition where you ran around uh, two to four stages wearing hoplite armor. Mm. Um, so your helmet greaves carrying a shield. Uh, the theory, it's, it came about in the late 6th century. And the theory, one of the theories... I guess I should say, is that it developed at, because that was the time when the Greeks were coming into contact with the Persians more and more. And um, the length of that race was about as far away as the Persian archers could shoot. So it was a military training exercise that turned into an athletic event, which is what most athletic events came in, were. They were originally military training exercises, or at least the theory goes. So it came about as an endurance and armor because you're running full uh, full speed at the Persians, not running uh, as, a, as a cohesive group. And it was just a military endurance training exercise. Anyway, I digress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, so we have the theater uh, where they had a, they put on plays there. Uh, and then we have the the games up the top. The games got uh, quite rowdy. Um, there was also um there's an inscription there that I find funny. It says that uh, wine wasn't allowed to be carried out of the stadium or you'd be fined five drachmas. <laughs> oh. So I always found that, I always found that funny. Uh, it got quite rowdy there, as in most stadiums. Uh, their victories at these four games, as well as the Panathenaic Games in Athens, uh, the winners were immortalized in a lot of the poems by uh, Simonides, Bacchylides, and Pindar, who were renowned composers of... Um, these victory odes. Um, so we have a lot of, we have a lot of details about certain event, uh, certain people who took place there because of the poems that have survived. It's pretty fascinating to read. If you ever get a chance. So in terms of the games proper, the organization of the games, it was administered by uh, what was called the Amphitonic league. And they attracted athletes from all over the Greek world. Uh, they declared what was called this period of sacred truce, um, so athletes could travel to Delphi and the temple of itself without without fear of being harmed or attacked by a hostile neighbor. Violation of that was was pretty rough. Um, so it had even graver effects for the uh, Pythian games because then than the other games. Because say if you violated that, you were at, uh, for the Olympic games, you were forbidden from participating at those games. But if you did it for the Pythian games, then you were also forbidden from visiting the sanctuary and consulting the oracle. So oh. it kind of had a double whammy. Ooh. And there was a reenact. It started with a reenactment by uh, Apollo 
uh, Apollo's victory over Python. And then there was a, a procession all the way up the, the way up to the top. And there was a ritual sacrifice at the Temple of Apollo. Um, there were competitions in poetry, performances with the alas so or the flute and the cathara, which is a string type instrument, kind of the forerunner of the guitar, uh, both with, without singing. And then on the fifth day, there was athletic events. Uh, these competition or these poetry and music competitions took place in the theater. Uh, the athletic events took place in the stadium, obviously, or down below in the uh, palestra. There were there was also a hippodrome that was built in the plains below as well uh, that held the uh, chariot racing. So in this stadium, as we alluded to, sat way high above Philadelphia itself, up on the cliffs of. Uh, up on the cliffs of Mount Parnassus, and it's very visible today. Initially, though, it was just a racing track, but uh, and spectators sat on the ground. But the Roman Emperor Hadrian, as he tended to do, uh, glamour, glam, uh, glamorized a lot of things. Yeah, I don't like that word. Improved a lot of things. <laughs> uh, he he added a lot him, and there was a lot of funds from the wealthy uh, Athenian named Herodes Atticus. And they uh, build these seats and the archway that's there. So what you're seeing now up there is Roman stuff. All the seats, all that stuff, that's la that's later. There's a monumental archway, as we mentioned. Um, there's also, you can see these uh, points in the track where the they would have put their feet as they started off to run. Um, a starting point, if you will. But the best preserved archaeological anything at, at Delphi is, is their theater, where... They had the musical and dramatic contests, uh, the contest at the Pythian Games. The original theater there was uh, built out of wooden seats, or they sat on the ground. It's in it's in the side of the hill. So, but uh, the first stone theater that we see there that was constructed in the fourth century, and then it was restored uh, in the second century by uh, Eumenides the Second, who was a king of Pergamum. Uh, and the material they use like local stone from Mount Parnassus. It's really it's really neat. It's really cool. Um, it's fascinating to go on. You can sit, you can stand in the middle of the temple, or sorry, you can stand in the middle of the theater and look out and get these beautiful, like, views. Like, just beautiful. And not only the plains underneath, but just basically the entire hillside of, like, looking down upon. When you see all those images looking down upon the Temple of Apollo and going down, that most of them are coming from the theater. It's really fascinating. It's, it's really beautiful. So, yeah, uh, it's yeah. one of the best well preserved ones. It's gorgeous, and if somebody is a traveler who loves history but also likes travel photography, it is mm -hmm. ridiculous how beautiful it is. And you do. You get that perfect. So often when you're at a Greek temple, you're at the level of it or below it. And this is one of the only times I think I've ever been above a Greek temple. And it's, so it's just a whole different kind of photography feel. If, some, if, if that is somebody's hobby, they should definitely make sure to go. Definitely. And as a, uh, a bit of a trivia or an interesting fact. So in, I think it was sometime, at some point in the 20, 1920s, it was the first time that the theater hosted an ancient Greek tragedy in modern time. And ever since then, ancient Greek drama, it's been a spike in like replaying ancient Greek drama in ancient Greek theaters and Roman theaters. Ancient Greek and Roman drama in ancient Greek and Roman theaters, I guess you should say. But it, it was in the 20s and it was at, this the, it was at that theater in Delphi. I've actually seen a uh, play at the one in Epidaurus. That was really cool. I didn't get a chance I to see one anywhere else. I have not. And I go to a lot of theaters where, like, clearly they do productions, and I haven't ever been able to go. But also, I've never researched it as part of, like, my trip, so I should. Yeah. That's, that's, my, that's my fault. I should do a better job. <laughs> I would definitely recommend it. The Odeon of Herodiaticus in Athens has them all the time. I actually saw one there, too. I actually saw an Italian opera. It had nothing to do with ancient Greece. I would love to see Shakespeare. I would love to see like an ancient, like one of his histories. That would just be fun. Yeah, I, I, I definitely would recommend that if you get the possibility. Also, uh, Syracuse, so Sicily. I, I've been there and I've seen a play in their theater, and they do it every summer. They have like a they 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 do kind of a mo I don't want to say a mock like Dionysia, but they do like three plays like they uh, every summer, uh, and I saw one there. And that was fascinating, too. Their theater isn't as um, well-preserved, but it's still preserved. Like, you can do things in it. It's just, it's not as preserved as, say, Epidaurus or the one at Delphi or the Roman Odeon at Athens, for instance. So they found an ancient Roman theater in Plovdiv, not an ancient Greek theater. 
But the Roman theater that they found, they found it not that long ago in the 20th century. And it's it's like the biggest and the best well-preserved. And it happens to be across from this music school. So the musical puts on productions there a lot. And it's not even that far away from me. I've just been super lazy and haven't gone out there. Uh, so besides the, so we got the stadium, the theater, and then what else do we have? The Sanctuary of Athena below the main sanctuary. So when you come to Delphi and you're like on the main driving road and as you pull in, you look up and you see like the mountain um, below the main, the mountain and below the main driving road is another sanctuary. So it's the sanctuary of Athena. Um, so it, it also, it had a fairly different function than the upper sanctuary. Uh, it also ha- had been used since the um, archaic periods and even into the Mycenaean settlement. Um, but so the fascinating thing there is the famous, the treasury Tholos that you see a lot of times when you see, like you said, uh, travel, uh, travel photography. So that famous, that's where that's held. And there's all sorts of shrines. So the sanctuary was, uh, there's three main temples in the sanctuary of Athena. Um, two of them are in ruins and there's one on the far, far right. That's so the Tholos, the circular building. It was uh, originally built in the 7th century, but uh, it was rebuilt in the late 6th after, you guessed it, an earthquake destroyed it. <laughs> so uh, Herodotus, when he was writing, which was in the 5th century, was he actually said that it was in ruins and rocks were inside the building. And then there was another natural disaster that kind of just finished, finished it off, um, several of the other buildings. Uh, Pausania or Plutarch tells an account of a it's a, an interesting account of the, of a murder that happened in the sanctuary. So a feud occurred when a groom canceled his mar- uh, the marriage uh, because the mixing bowl had broken. So the father's uh, the bride's father threw him over the cliff into the sanctuary, and he was tried and condemned. So with the money from from his uh, so he was confiscated uh, his money was confiscated, and then the other two temples were built were rebuilt with that money uh, that had been destroyed. So interesting. Plutarch, as I said, was a uh, a priest uh, at, at Delphi during the uh, the second century AD, so during the Roman period. Uh, Del, we'll mention it. We'll talk about it. But Delphi was still going strong at that point. So the Tholos of Delphi is considered by many to be a masterpiece of ancient Greek architecture. So definitely go down and see it if you have the possi- uh, if you have the chance. A lot of people completely forget it's there since it's not in the main sanctuary. It's just, it's very beautiful. There's inner colonnade and outer colonnades. Uh, it has Corinthian style. It's a, it's a later piece because, like I said, the earthquake destroyed it. It has lots of friezes, typical of uh, scenes of cent- the Centaramaki, Amazonamaki that you can see in the museum and the labors of Heracles. There's also a gymnasium complex down there. Uh, so it was constructed at some point in the fourth century. We can see remains of the palestra, which is where the wrestling and boxing practice area would have, would have taken place. So, so the, the original palestra, not the U Penn Arena. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> palestra, like the Greek term, not the uh, yeah, not the U Penn Arena, which is I like, but I like it too. I went to U Penn for ed school. Uh, that's where I like uh, when I was teaching, they made us go there at night, and so I love U Penn, but uh, this is the real one. <laughs> yeah, as an aside. <laughs> The UPenn Archaeological Museum is really cool, too. Yeah. Uh, so check that out. <laughs> uh, I grew up like an hour away, or an hour and a half away or so, so I used to visit it quite a few times. So, yeah, there's a – they did their training for wrestling and boxing down here, and this is where the competitions took place, obviously, down in this area. Uh, you can see a lot of remains of kind of what the gymnasium complex would have looked like. Uh, you can see, like, stoas and remains of stoas. I mean, obviously, it's kind of – it's not all together put together, but uh, it's it's fascinating. So that's Delphi, uh, the best things to see. There's a lot of things to see in the museum, so make sure you see the museum. Uh, it was one of my favorite museums in Greece. So what happened that it went from this huge power center to an archaeological ruin? So it's not as interesting as the conversation we had with the Acropolis of Athens. It doesn't have... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when the Romans conquered Greece and it came under their control, did what they did with a lot of Greek sanctuaries. They plundered it and took back some of their stuff to Rome, but they didn't destroy it completely. One of the main sackings that took place was by Sulla in 86 BC during his Mithridatic Wars. And then 
in 67 AD or CE, whatever dating convention you want to use, uh, Nero took 500 statues back to Rome. There were still at that point, I think it's like 3,000 left or something. So it's not like they were just like completely just plundering and destroying it. They were taking some of the uh, the hits back, but still. Okay, and then subsequent Roman emperors of the Flavian dynasty uh, started to restore it because at that point it kind of fell into any earthquakes of things like that. It, it started to look like it was getting in bad shape. And then there was emperors like Hadrian especially who built it up uh, as we talked about with the uh, stadium and things like that. But after Hadrian, it started to gradually lose its importance. And then Constantine took a lot of stuff to uh, his new capital, Constantinople. And finally, in uh, 381 AD, which is the famous date for when Theodosius II shut down the pagan sanctuaries, including Delphi. And he basically silenced the oracle by destroying the temple, most of the statues and works of art. And I guess in order to allow Christianity to strive without competition in his empire. Uh, Julian the Apostate, who followed up. One of my favorite Roman emperors. I forgot to mention him. He wanted to restore it, too. He sent emissaries to Delphi, uh, but the Pythian told him that the courts were shut down and Apollo no longer resided here. And then, so that, that, was, that was their response. Uh, so um, Christianity reigned supreme since then in the area, and time and natural disasters added to the desolation of it. And during the Ottoman period, there was a village called Castri that was founded on the site of Delphi, and the locals used, partly used the marble from the ruins in the construction of their villages, the, build, the buildings of their villages. It was a small village, though. It was nothing like huge or huge scale. I mean, you're living on a mountainside. Uh, and eventually, the precise location of Delphi was lost. People just didn't know where it was because the village was on top of it. Um, archaeologists set out in the 17th century using Pausanias as their guide, and they found, they found it, or what they thought was it. Turned out they were right. But there was about 200 or so inhabitants who lived on it with many homes and buildings. And I say many, like whatever many is for 200 inhabitants. I don't know the precise number, but uh, they got permission and the village was destroyed. The inhabitants were relocated further south uh, by the government. And the uh, archaeological digging, exploratory at this point, uh, happened by the French archaeological school in the late 19th century. And so during the excavation, the French archaeologists removed a vast amount of soil from all of the landslides that had covered the major buildings, thanks to all the earthquakes that happened, because it is a very volatile area. And the new village that was created for the inhabitants of Castri is now part of mo- what is now modern-day Delphi, and they don't really need, they don't use that name anymore locally. So, what did they? What's the town called now? Like, what does it look like on the maps? Pretty sure it's just Delphi. Oh, I thought you said that they don't use that name anymore. They don't use the name of Castri anymore. Oh, sorry. So the inhabitants were located down to what is now modern day Delphi, down like the village area. So Ryan, since you saw so much of Greece, after somebody sees Delphi or on their way to Delphi, what other things should they do if they're taking the time to get out of Athens that are reasonably nearby? So if you're coming out of Athens, there are a few options you have. First on the way is Thebes. I actually didn't get a chance to go there, but they have, Thebes has a new museum that's open since I have last been to Greece. So I definitely hear good things about that. So check that out. Um, but there's also, you can stop at Thermopylae. Uh, there's not a whole lot left, but you can see kind of, you can get the feeling about, I mean, the um, the uh, coastline has definitely eroded. You don't see like, you don't get the Herodotus-like description, but you can see the plaque that was there and you can kind of get a feeling about it. It's on the way to Delphi anyway. And there's just, it's, there's beautiful countryside. There's a Meteora, which a lot of people go to. That's in central Greece as well. Which I pronounce Meteora because I'm a, I'm not a, I'm not an ancient Greek scholar. <laughs> I mean, it's not an ancient Greek monastery either. So I could be, <laughs> it's a, it's a later thing. So I could be messing that up. My Greek pronunciation is terrible. So like, I don't stay consistent. That's, that's the issue. I, uh, I use ancient Greek pronunciation. I use modern Greek pronunciation. I use Anglicized and it drives people crazy at times. Like I, I'm just not a consistent person. So whatever. Like Delphi, <laughs> Delphi, I use both of them. Uh, people die. I, whatever. I know what you're talking about. And that's all that matters. The, <laughs> speaking, like your ability to communicate and people understand what you're saying is all that matters. Anyway, uh, so when you get to so Delphi, and if you're already going to be up that far away, you might as well continue a little north and go to Litohoro and see Mount Olympus where the the gods lived, supposedly. 
So it's that's that's a, quite an interesting hike to get to the top. My feet were super sore uh, <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> uh, most people don't actually do the hike. They just or they do the hike, but they don't actually do the climb. Um, yeah, it was fun to do, but I don't think something I'd ever do again. Uh, it's something I check <laughs> off my, my bucket list. So it was cool. Uh, Little Horror is really cool. The uh, town around it. Uh, you got to see Mount Olympus. You got to see. So if you're going to be in that region, might as well continue. And then obviously you can keep going north until you eventually get to your location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of cool sites in northern Greece. Uh, it is Delphi is really cool. Like I said, it, it is a few. It's a, it's a little out of the way from Athens, and even more so if you're an, an ancient. But getting there today, obviously we have modern transportation so it's only a few hours it's a great trip if you're driving i i went on a coach bus with a tour so i didn't have to worry about any of it and i just looked out the window and saw all these beautiful uh uh, picturesque images uh, not images i guess uh scenery (laughs) um as i was driving by um so that was really cool it's 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 a very beautiful location i mean most of greece is uh, as you're driving throughout the countryside yeah uh greece is not a ugly place to travel (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for some reason it's people just keep going there because it's one of the most beautiful places in the world um well ryan thank you so much for coming on again and uh talking about another site in ancient greece seeing as how you've been to so many of them my pleasure uh hopefully you'll have me back for a third time i get better as i as i age <laughs> yeah definitely so where can listeners find you because they should definitely check out your show and you have a pretty active Twitter and Facebook situation happening, too. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, Twitter at, at Greek History Pod. I know it's confusing because it's the history of ancient Greece. At that point, the handles had to be certain characters, so I just and now I just stuck with it. <laughs> there had to be certain character lengths, so, and now I just stuck with it because that's what I am. Uh, so at Greek History Pod, um, there's also the Facebook uh, page, The History of Ancient Greece. It doesn't say podcast in the title. Uh, it's just the history of ancient Greece, although I probably should put podcast in the title because most of the people who follow me just think I post cool pictures and links. They didn't realize there's podcasts attached, <laughs> so I had to like, keep reminding people that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I also – you can I have a website, thehistoryofancientgreece.com. There's all sorts of cool photos, pictures, uh, links to things. I'm continuously updating it. There's timelines, show notes, bibliography, other podcast recommendations – including a fangirl history and oh um you can i'm on itunes uh i'm on pretty much wherever any podcasts are uh they're on the web on the website there's links on the right hand side to pretty much anywhere you want to get it from google play stitcher tune in you know where people consume podcasts excellent well uh thank you so much and we will definitely talk thank you bye I want to say thank you again to Ryan for coming on the show. Definitely check out his podcast, The History of Ancient Greece, to delve further into the people, myths, and history of ancient Greece. You could also make sure to listen to the episode that he and I recorded for this show about the Acropolis if you haven't heard it already. Definitely check it out. It was a really good one. We will skip the housekeeping except to say if you haven't left a review on iTunes yet, you should. It would be super cool if you would go do that right now. Thanks for listening.